Okay, Martin, can you fix that, please? Okay. Um, the um, African-Americans have a 1.3 and a 1.8 fold increase in the risk of uh, suffering non-fatal uh, stroke uh, respectively. Uh, in addition, uh, African-Americans are twice as likely as uh, general Americans to have uh, failure and deaths from diabetes. And diabetes is the third leading cause of death in African-American women. Uh, we put out a journal, the National Medical Association on racial disparities in kidney disease. And since I'm a kidney doctor, I'm gonna talk briefly on that. Uh, there's been a gene found called AP01 uh, in African-Americans, mostly those from the West Coast of Africa. And that's been identified uh, to, be the, uh, to be the primary cause of uh, renal failure in blacks not necessarily related, related to, uh, to diabetes. Um, there are striking uh, uh, racial differences in in-state renal disease. Blacks have the highest rate of renal disease and renal failure uh, in the world, uh, followed by uh, Native Americans, uh, Asians, Hawaiians, South Pacific Islanders, uh, and lastly, uh, by uh, Caucasians. Um, Hispanics also have higher rates of, uh, of renal failure uh, than other groups, but African-Americans are the largest. African-Americans make up less than 15% of the U.S. population, but they make up close to 50% of the population on dialysis. There are multiple risk factors for chronic kidney disease, which leads to end-stage <laughs> renal disease. Uh, diabetes and hypertension are the main causes, with diabetes being more than 47% of the cause, high blood pressure, almost 30% of the cause. But look at this older age, family history of kidney disease, reduced kidney mass. Uh, African-Americans are born with a reduced kidney mass. So that starts early on. So smoking also affects that and systemic infections and autoimmune diseases as well. We talked earlier about the ACE2 receptor being the place where the coronavirus uh, potentially gets in the body, located in the oral pharynx, nasal pharynx, the eyes, and the lungs. And this looks at what angiotensin II, which is a major uh, effector of cardiovascular disease, does in the brain, blood vessels, uh, heart, and the kidneys. And the way that we stop that disease that angiotensin II mediates its effects by binding to the AT1 and the A2 receptor, which is now called the ACE2 receptor. And we believe that this is why we keep our patients on the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blocking agents. Uh, at one time, it was thought that that might uh, uh, offer immunity, but I think those drugs themselves, uh, at the very least, should be continued and may offer some uh, protection by uh, blocking that uh, site. We know that untreated hypertension, which is one of the, the baseline causes of kidney failure and disease, uh, can affect the brain with a stroke, can affect the heart and the blood vessels with a heart attack, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, and also kidney failure uh, can be a part of that. So the principal targets that we use to try to stop uh, the advance of kidney disease for high blood pressure, one is to lower uh, the blood pressure. Uh, some people say my blood pressure is 200 over 100. And uh, many white doctors in Beverly Hills say, well, that's OK. Your blood pressure is supposed to be higher. No, your blood pressure should be 120 over 80. The lower your blood pressure is, the longer you have the potential of living. We also know that uh, protein, is a, protein in the urine is a sign of kidney damage. So with our ACE inhibitors and with angiotensin receptor blocking agent, we titrate so we have no proteinuria. If you have foamy urine, that could be a sign of uh, kidney disease and should be seen by an internist or preferably a nephrologist or a kidney specialist. I only want to call your attention here, uh, looking on the non-traditional cause after anemia is inflammation. We know that inflammation is a major cause, uh, if not the only cause of disease all over the body. And we know that part of that is 
because of the elevation of reactive oxygen species. That's why we promote antioxidants, green leafy vegetables, and uh, the use of things like nitric oxide. I'll let Dr. Tyler deal with that. Do drugs affect blacks and whites uh, differently? They do. We know that uh, we don't support the use of beta blockers uh, for high blood pressure in blacks unless you have a rapid heart rate or unless you've had an MI. And there are studies that have shown that a beta blocker combined with a, a diuretic can lead to an earlier death. So I suggest that anybody with high blood pressure see a physician who's familiar with treating hypertension in blacks. We believe that they should be treated either with angiotensin receptor blocking agents or ACE inhibitors. Uh, that has a salutary effect and reduces the pressure inside the kidney, plus a calcium channel blocker and our vasodilators. We also know that it takes between two and four simultaneous antihypertensive medications to appropriately control uh, blood pressure in most people. Uh, this is an article in a journal that we put out called Racial and Ethnic Differences in Response to Medicine. We know that every ethnic group, we may be created equal under God, but we're physiologically different and medicines do act differently. I wanna speak a moment about mortality multipliers. This shows the, the effect if you have no disease on the column on the left. If you have diabetes only, it raises your risk of death to 1.5. If you add chronic kidney disease, it takes you up to 2.0. If you have diabetes and kidney disease, it multiplies it to 2.4. If you have uh, heart disease, congestive heart failure, it takes you to 2.9. And if you have all of them, it makes your rate of death at 6.3. And a lot of us have all three or four of those diseases. Uh, about abdominal fat. There are many of you who may be shaped like a pear and some shaped like an apple. If you're shaped like an apple, which means you have a big belly, that increases your risk of cardiovascular deaths. If you look on the left, it shows you cardiovascular deaths with the red and the high one, it shows you the highest rate of death uh, in cardiovascular deaths in general. In the middle column, it shows you myocardial infarction is a heart attack. And the last column on the right shows all cause death. The numbers are in centimeters, but if you divide each one by 2.4, it will tell you that if you're a man and your waist size is above 40, if you're a woman and your waist size is above 34, you're at increased risk for cardiovascular death. Why is that? Because fat, although we consider it unsightly, is not the unsightliness. What this slide shows is that there are a number of hormones, almost as many as 50, that would account for all the bad things that happened. I did a consultation in Mississippi on a young lady, 35 years old, who had uh, uh, renal failure, heart failure. She had COVID. I consulted her at 11 a.m. She was dead by five with a cytokine storm. If you look at the, on the right, you see leptin, uh, tumor necrosis factor, uh, adiponectin, angiotensin, PA1. These all cause the cytokine storm. And when you're fat, when you're obese, you have more of this there. Uh, you have a higher level of CRP, free fatty acids, and all the things that can lead to those death things that happen. This slide is not meant to be humorous, but every teenager knows that when you smoke pot, you get the munchies. Well, this simply validates that when you're obese, that the way obese people are driven to eat is because of something called the endocannabinoid system uh, in the hypothalamus. So you actually produce your own natural pot, so to speak, uh, in the brain and that drives you to eat more and that drives you to have the hormones that can put you into the cytokine storm. I was giving this talk uh, primarily to speak about what are some of the things that we face due to environment, to the way we eat, we know in a general way, people know uh, what they need to do to live a healthy life, but many people don't make a connection or that between a cause and effect of what they do. If they eat pork chops, there's an effect. They eat fat, there's an effect. They eat sugar, there's an effect. Uh, we do know that the protection of and the health development of health should have a public health focus. We need this badly in our, in our family of our 
neighborhoods of people of color. We know that there are also genetic causes, but there are also environmental matters that affect us very sincerely. Thank you. I'll answer any questions and we'll go to the next speaker after that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maxey. Yes. You, you made a comment about the uh, ARB uh, angiotensin receptor blockers and the ACE inhibitors. Um, I'm sorry, uh, a ARBs. Yes, and ACE inhibitors blocking the AT2 or uh, ACE2 receptor and thereby uh, would that make them protective against COVID-19? I'm not prepared to say that. A recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine suggested that we leave patients on them, on those medications. There was a thought before we weren't sure whether those ACE2 reblock blocker agents would upregulate the site or downregulate it. It may be neutral. I personally think it blocks it and may make uh, it less likely, but I'm not prepared to give a scientific answer. And the research has not been done on that yet. Thank you. Are there any questions in the chat box, Judy? Okay. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Carolyn Towler, uh, who is a friend of mine, a radiologist. Uh, uh, she is both uh, an engineer uh, and a physician. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Tyler, the floor is yours. Dr. Tyler, you might be muted. Okay, I'm just trying to. I have to share okay, we can hear you now. I have to share my screen. We see your screen. You're sharing. Okay, you can see it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm going to talk really fast so you can preview the slides as I run through them. I kind of like this slide here because to me, it depicts what's going on with COVID. It's just like a chaotic, topsy turvy situation that we're in. So that's why I kind of skewed everything, but this talk is basically about nutrition in the days of COVID and beyond and evidence-based nutritional guidelines. Okay, so first, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so first I'd like to mention a little quote that I saw here that I really like. It says, we don't get to choose when we were born. We don't choose what natural disasters, epidemiological emergencies, stock market crashes, tyrannical regime, regimes, or wars our generation face. We only get to choose how we react. That was on the front of the Oberlin College um, magazine, and I thought that was very fitting. Uh, first, since I'm a radiologist, I'm just going to show you some representative images of what COVID um, looks like. Now, remember, COVID-19 is... Somebody's speaking. Um, Mute your phones. COVID-19 is the syndrome of all of the different symptoms of the COVID infection. The infection itself is COVID SARS-2. So we, we want to be clear about what we're talking about. COVID-19 is the whole spectrum of all the symptoms and respiratory disease that goes along with the infection itself. Um, so these are typical, well, this is not totally typical, but this is an example of some of the manifestations of COVID on a chest X-ray. You can see the heart in the middle there that's outlined. Um, this patient has some tubes like a nasogastric tube, a central venous line, and you can see you might not appreciate it, but these are not well expanded lungs. And you see these peripheral white areas, black is air in the lungs. So white means there's something replacing the air. And that, uh, that is the infiltrate, that's the infection that's going on. It tends to be peripheral um, more commonly than not, uh, but it's still kind of nonspecific. So in this particular patient, about five days later, this patient developed what's known as a pneumothorax, which means the entire left lung, this is the right, this is the left, your left is usually more towards the 
um, the heart is more towards the left side. In this case, this is air outside of the lungs and it literally collapsed the lung here. So you can imagine this patient was in severe respiratory distress. Um, here's another later chest X-ray over here. And you can see that the pneumothorax has resolved. They put in a chest tube. And so the lungs, the air was removed and the lungs re-expanded. The patient still has bilateral patchy densities, again, more peripheral than central. What is and, a pneumothorax, Dr. Tyler? A pneumothorax is air that is outside of the lung, inside of the chest. So it literally gets in the space between the lung and the chest wall and it can collapse the lung. So now this patient is not aerating this lung. Um, and by putting in a chest tube, it sucks out the air and then re-expands the lung as you can see here. Now in this picture, you've got more diffuse bilateral infiltrates, the white areas. So again, this patient is not getting a lot of air in their lungs. And this would go along with the low oxygen saturation in the blood. Um, this is in progression to respiratory distress syndrome, which people talk about, which is more towards the end stage. I don't know what the um, sequelae was for that patient, if that patient survived or not. Before you move on, could I ask a question about that previous x-ray? Sure. On uh, the 29th? Mm -hmm. uh, is there um, either air or fluid under the right diaphragm? causing an elevation of the diaphragm? Um, at, usually there's no air. There's, well, you, usually it depends on if it's, if it's an upright film. If it's an upright film, you would usually see air underneath the diaphragm. So you would see a sliver of the air going like that. This is a portal chest X-ray. So it's most likely taken with the patient laying flat. Um, well, is, is that diaphragm elevated though? Well, both so diaphragms are elevated both the, the lung volumes are decreased. Now, right. normally normally the right hemidiaphragm is more elevated than the left. If there's fluid under the diaphragm, what you look for is tinting of the diaphragm where you'll see a little bulge more further laterally. I see. Um, but it's harder to tell when a patient is laying flat as opposed to laying upright. But it's, it is an observation that the right hemidiaphragm Diaphragm is elevated, but so is the left. Poor lung volumes. The lungs aren't expanded fully. Um, this is an example of a patient who came into our clinic and had a chest X-ray. And it's, I apologize, it was cut off at the top. But here, this kind of demonstrates these peripheral, vague opacities. We call this kind of like a ground glass appearance. You can see some lung markings through it, but it's not, they're not distinct. And you, you don't really see clear vessels going through the lungs. So this is the beginnings of an infiltrate involving COVID-19. Again, it's not specific. You can see this in other types of infections as well, but this tends to be more of a pattern that's typical with COVID-19. And this patient had a later chest X-ray and I did apologize for the cutoff, but if you can appreciate, there's a little more air in the periphery here. So this patient is improving. So that's, that's a good thing. Okay, so now we're gonna go to nutrition. And as was mentioned uh, as a disclaimer, anything stated in this presentation is only for educational purposes, not meant to treat, heal, repair any illness, disease, or injury. Um, of course, you would contact your personal healthcare provider before following any recommendations or suggestions that are made in this presentation. Um, most of the data I got with regard to the nutrition and supplements is from a myriad of places, but also I relied heavily on the Institute of Functional Medicine who has a COVID virus task force. And they took a look at what supplements had evidence basis for utility in a COVID infection. Again, knowing that nothing can cure COVID 19 as of yet. So that's just the disclaimer. Now there's a lot here, but I'm just going to summarize. Okay, what do we eat? What should we eat? Okay, first of all, people should know the difference between macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Okay, everybody's familiar with those. Micronutrients are all the vitamins, 
and the phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are substances that were not named as vitamins because a deficiency was not associated with them. Vitamins are nutrients that we know when you're deficient, there's an actual disease. So everything else we call phytochemicals, you know, we don't know exactly what they are, but we know that in combination that they're providing a lot of nutrition and health for the body. Now what's recommended is six to nine servings of vegetables per day, which means like a handful. Okay. So, you know, that means you should be eating like two servings, three servings, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's what you primarily want to eat because that's what's giving you most of your nutrients. You want as many colors of the rainbow as possible, include lots of greens because there's lots of fiber. And basically that should encompass half of your plate. But don't forget to eat the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, arugula, dandelion greens, et cetera. Those have potent anti-cancer properties. You should be eating some of those every day. Now, the average recommendation, and Dr. Maxi may have something to say about this, but the average recommendation is 30 grams of protein per meal for three meals. Now, that's probably for a 175 kilogram man. So you would have to adjust that you know, for your size and your weight. Um, the serving should fit in the palm of your hand. Okay, so the meat should be the condiment and the vegetable should be most of your plate. And then the other quarter of your plate um, could be for like, you know, sweet potatoes, um, resistant starches. We're going to talk about rice and things like that um, in a little bit. If you're going to eat meat and it, you know, there's controversy, but basically the consensus among various nutritionists seems to be, except for the extremists, that it's okay to eat meat. But if you're going to eat meat, red meat in particular, eat grass-fed meat, because what the meat, what the animals are eating is what you are eating. So you don't want GMOs, you don't want pesticides, you know, you don't want corn um, in, 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 your, in your body. And corn, because of it, it's, it's very starchy and most corn is GMO, unless you get it organic or unless it's sweet corn. So you wanna eat grass-fed meats, you wanna preferentially eat pasteurized eggs, which means they're out in the pasture, not just free range. Free range just means they open the gate to the hen house. Okay, but it doesn't mean that they get out. So they're not getting a lot of exercise. Um, you wanna eat the lowest processed meats as, that you can buy. If you can't afford organic, just get ones that are minimally processed. Um, moving on, it's okay to eat eggs, okay? There's been a long-standing controversy, but the consensus of nutritionists today is that the problem with heart disease is not primarily cholesterol that it is the sugar. And there's a large body of evidence that shows that that information was suppressed and intentionally skewed towards cholesterol being the problem. In fact, a couple of researchers from Harvard were paid to implicate cholesterol as the problem for heart disease when they knew it was sugar. And they got paid for doing that. Now, if one has a familiar or hereditary form of hyperlipidemia, which is high fat levels or high cholesterol, that's another thing because there's a mechanism of action that leads to that high cholesterol or high triglycerides. Know that 80% of cholesterol is made in the liver. So only 20% comes from the diet. But of course you have to look at your own numbers and discuss that with your, with your doctor. Um, let's see, eat good fats. Okay, We're, we've been afraid of fat. Uh, when fats went low, when everything turned to low fat, the heart disease rose even further. Why? Because they replaced the fat with sugar. Um, same thing with high fructose corn syrup when that came out. The rate of heart disease skyrocketed because more people were eating high fructose corn syrup, which was leading to, you know, hyperproduction of insulin. And insulin, when it's not utilized, it leads to the storage of fat, like that visceral apple fat that Dr. Maxi was referring to. Um, and sugar is sugar is sugar, okay? There's not much difference between the different types of sugar. However, it's known that for diabetics, if you're going to eat sugar, maple syrup may be what you want to use. First of all, it's, it's very sweet, so you only need a little bit, but also it doesn't raise the insulin level as high as, as sugar does. Um, but I wanted to go back to the fats. The MUFAs are your good fats, monounsaturated fats. I remember for years they were talking about 
polyunsaturated fats. And I was like, oh, okay, safflower oil, canola oil, all those are good for you. No, they're not good for you because they're highly refined and they produce a lot of chemicals in the process that are harmful to the body. So the best fats are the monounsaturated fats, avocados, walnuts, almonds, olives, olive oil. I just made a mnemonic called wow, okay, or whale if you want. Um, stick to low mercury fish, no more than twice a week, like wild salmon, black cod, haddock, sardine, shrimp, the smaller, the smaller fish. Um, let's see, stay below 25 grams of added sugar and 50 grams of total sugar per day. So that means when you're buy buying something that's processed, look on the label, look for the added sugars, you should be eating less than 25 grams a day. And 50 grams includes all of your sugars, including your fruit. Note that yogurt has like 18 or more grams of sugar. They've been coming down now. Like Chobani has gone down to nine grams of sugar. So that's progress. Grains, avoid or limit your grains unless you're like in an ideal weight, unless you're athletic, um, especially gluten containing grains because the body does not know how to process gluten. And that's why so many people are sensitive to it and may not even know it. I turned out to be sensitive and I had to figure that out myself. Okay, so moving along. Let's see. Okay, so I already said kind of avoid grains if you're trying to lose weight or if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic because um, it can lead to increased insulin resistance. Okay, don't drink milk or dairy in general. Many are lactose intolerant. Avoid farm fish or meat. Beans are not a great source of protein because they're not a complete protein and they contain lectins that can cause inflammation. Avoid nightshade vegetables if you have arthritis, osteoarthritis. Okay, and these are just some more don'ts. Avoid white sugar, white potatoes, white flour, white rice, any form of sugar. Um, any form of pasta is going to turn into sugar. Flour turns into sh sugar. Um, stay away from processed meats. Okay, so I'm just gonna move forward and just talk a little bit about the supplements that we've, found that might be helpful with COVID. Now, this is a list based on the Institute of Functional Medicine. There's a long list here. Um, don't worry about that. You can go to the Institute of Functional Medicine and read about each one of these. I've highlighted just a few of them that there seems to be a lot of hubbub about. Vitamin A, you've heard about vitamin C, vitamin D, 5,000 I use daily. Um, quercetin, one gram twice daily inhibits viral replication. Um, that's green tea, N-acetylcysteine, that's good for brain health as well, was veritrol, good for longevity, curcumin, anti-inflammatory. Okay, so just to highlight, when you're looking for supplements, there are a couple things you should look for. Look for USP, GMP, or other third-party verifications. Look for evidence-based research. You're going to see a lot of products on the market now that contain some of those substances that are proposed for, for um, COVID. This is the first radiation biologist in the world who came up with a supplement for the military and then added things that are protect against 5G and also COVID and they have to be the same products. So this is just a picture of the drive-through where I work for testing. The end. Yes. yes. Um, how important is nutrition to the immune system? It's, it's critical to the immune system. And one of the things that we overlook and that many people don't recognize is we're eating not only for ourselves, but we're eating for the bacteria in our bodies. The bacteria in our bodies are so important towards our overall health. They control the vagus nerve which is the nerve that controls your digestion, um, your heart rate, your sleep, and everything. And when you eat junk, you're feeding the good bacteria junk. So what happens is the bad bacteria take over. You can then get a leaky gut where undigested proteins get into the body, into the bloodstream, and your immune system can react to them. So it's, it's such an intricate system. What you do to one part of it affects all of it. So it's critical to every aspect of your health. Well, thank you so much. Are there any questions in the chat box for um, Dr. Tyler? 
I'll check right now. Okay. Um, there's a couple of comments. Uh, oh, here's one. Please speak about the problems that you're seeing in respiratory diseases and the impact you're seeing in North America. And then another one, uh, we talk about uh, health disparities, but it seems that the underlying issue with COVID-19 is age, respiratory diseases that are running rampant in North America. The blacks and brown people seem to be dying because of lack of access to health care and projective diseases. And then it goes on with a couple other statements. Okay, let her answer those first. Two. Well, for one thing, um, what Dr. Maxey mentioned when he talked about the incidence of hypertension, obesity, diabetes, those are multiple times higher in, in Black people. You can pick just about any disease and the morbidity of that disease in Black people is two to three times higher of the general population. So we've got to deal with our underlying health, much of which starts with nutrition. Blacks drink more sodas than any other health group. And sodas are one of the worst things you can drink. It's pure sugar. We've got to start with our nutrition. Also, Especially what's been, soda. pardon? Especially grape soda. It's, yeah, I mean, all sodas are just bad. They're just, fruit juices are bad for you. It's concentrated sugar. Um, juicing is controversial because you're omitting the fiber. But I wanna to speak to the issue of the respiratory disease. They're finding, and I've been reading that, surprisingly, the ones who are succumbing from COVID are not necessarily the ones that you would think, the ones with respiratory disease, the ones with asthma, the ones with COPD. It's more the patient with diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. So they're actually invoking that this may be more of a vascular phenomenon than actually a respiratory phenomenon that's causing the low, P, the low oxygenation in the blood. So certainly it's causing damage in the lungs, but actually the predisposition is higher in those with diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. So we've got to get those things under control. There are a couple other questions, Dr. Maxey. Yeah. One is, are probiotics useful? And also about the supplement astragalus for the immune system. Do you have any information on that? Okay, probiotics are very useful and they're necessary because they're feeding the good bacteria. You want the good bacteria to grow and to suppress the bad bacteria. Um, the cheapest, uh, probably the cheapest probiotic you can get is sauerkraut and eat two tablespoons of sauerkraut a day. And that gives you a trillion bacteria, which is more than you can get in any commercial probiotic. Um, but there are different species, of course, that you wanna get. Um, and, and what was the other? And about question? astragalus for immune systems? Okay, you know, um, okay, astragalus is considered an, an adaptogen. So it kind of works with the body's ability to, it enhances the body's ability uh, to function. So I'm not going to say specifically what it does because the, they, these things do a lot of things. Um, that's, that's one of the ones, however, that lengthens the telomeres. And the telomeres are the caps on the end of your chromosomes. And the longer the, the longer the ends of your chromosomes remain, the longer you live. Jellyfish, their telomeres never lengthen. They die because they get killed. But their telomeres never lengthen because they have an enzyme that keeps it from shortening, are shortened. But astragalus is one of those that lengthens the telomeres. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tyler. So hopefully you'll be uh, around for the discussion we're gonna have as a panel. Uh, I'd like to uh, take great pleasure in introducing uh, our celebrity guest for today. Um, I happened to have met her when I was a freshman medical student at Howard University. And I was about 10 and she was about five. So I'd like to introduce uh, this young lady. Uh, she came on the stage with Jerry Butler and uh, I had to look up, I thought Aretha Franklin was singing. But I'd like to introduce my friend and my family member. Uh, Brent, I started to call you Dr. Brenda, but Brenda oh. was eager. <laughs> so is yours, Brenda. 
Good morning, everyone. It's, it's, I, I couldn't believe it that he actually called me to, to do this. I've been on the call most of the time, but you know, I'm like a family member and, and it's just an honor to be here with and getting this information. You know, I knew about the sauerkraut and I used to do that and I have to start back, start back my walking and doing my sauerkraut. But in this time of change, I'd like to sing a song from my friend, uh, Billy Osborne. I started to say Billy Osborne, that's a co writer, but uh, Curtis Mayfield. Long time ago, he wrote this song. Recently, you sent me a trailer of a movie that you're doing, and I'm wondering oh. if you could just speak on that experience of working with with the bread basket. Yes, when I was when I was a young girl, a younger girl, and 21, I joined Operation Bread Basket, which was headed up by Reverend Jesse Jackson, who was very young at that time, and he headed up the economic arm of SCLC. And we had a 126 piece choir and a 20 piece orchestra. He pulled myself out, my best friend, Patty Henley, Sue Conway and Dolores Scott. And the four of us, he named the Piper Rats of Freedom. And, what, and, and the movie you're talking about is, uh, it's called Soul Sisters. And it's my story and Patty Henley's story of how 
the four of us actually marched and helped to get every black official elected. We were right there with Jesse marching in the streets and singing on flatbed trucks in the rain and singing on top of buses. We'd sing early in the morning and he'd speak and then we'd go door to door to get people to vote. In Cleveland, we have to get uh, Carl Stokes elected by after singing, going door to door and saying, my name is Brenda Lee Yeager and I've come from Chicago and I want you to get out and vote. And some of the people would say, it's nine o'clock in the morning, it's too late. I mean, it's too early. And I would say, but I've come from Chicago to spend this week with you to help get your mayor elected. And they would just, okay. And they'd sign up and they would vote. And we did that in DC, we did it in New Jersey, we did it all over and we got those people elected. And we were right there every night when they won. But since then, the movie is about our lives, our 50 years of friendship in the movement and trying to make the world better. We go into schools now and we teach kids through music, the history that they would never learn in the history books. So that's what the movie is about. And uh, it should be out in the first of next year and it's called Soul Sisters, so look for it. But I love what I do. And um, I hope to keep on till I fall of just trying to be an inspiration to all who I come in contact with. So that's my story in a nutshell. Although I'm, I'm a Southern girl, I'm from the cotton picking fields of Alabama. I could tell you a whole lot about that, but that would take a lifetime. I remember one comment that I took away from that trailer. There was a Reverend Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton, yeah. And he was saying that the way we should approach this current situation of structural and actual racism is with a sustained indignation. That changes things. Yes. Well, thank you so much. It, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. Thank you all so much. And hi to Richard. Okay. Um, I'm going to have the distinct honor of introducing uh, my president, the president of the National Medical Association. We represent uh, minority doctors, predominantly Black, in the United States of America. And uh, I was so happy when I spoke to Dr. McDougal, my Dr. McDougal, whom I was present on the Zoom when we uh, installed him as the president of the National Medical Association. And I'm gonna give him the floor, but as he comes, Dr. McDougal, would you be kind enough to give many people on the phone who don't know the history of the National Medical Association and who are we? Oh. I remember one time I looked up NMA and I came up with the National Mining Association. But as you give your talk, can you just enlighten us on the front end of who the National Medical Association is and what number of president you are? And we have a great anniversary right now. This is our 125th year, I think. Dr. McDougall, the floor is yours. Uh Thank you, uh, President uh, Randall Maxey. I also want to honor and acknowledge uh, President Richard Allen Williams. And with the talk earlier about cardiovascular risk factors, you have the father of the Association of Black Cardiologists on this call. So just want to <laughs> give you both a, a shout out. And uh, and that's a very good question. So for people uh, in the audience today, the National Medical Association dates back to 1895. Interestingly, when you look at the history, it goes uh, before that. So the American Medical Association uh, refused to uh, seat three, uh, member, three African-American physicians uh, in his uh, membership in 1870 and 1872. And so what's significant about those uh, dates, that's five and seven years after the end of the Civil War. So, and, and when you uh, look 
even further when we talk about uh, specialties and various access to uh, persons within African American communities. When you go to 1963, uh, there were 5,000 African American physicians and 227,000 uh, European American physicians. And, uh, and so with not allowing African Americans to join the uh, AMA, it prohibited uh, us from being able to uh, obtain hospital privileges it also limited access to uh, specialty training. Uh, so, so Dr. Maxi, did, did I go far enough back? <laughs> so I'm just so, so that's 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 the origin of of the uh, National uh, Medical Association. So, uh, so uh, this being our 125th uh, anniversary, uh, which is uh, a uh, landmark time for us to reflect upon our history and uh, celebrate the future. Uh, so with today, uh, uh, Dr. Maxey, since we're on the topic of uh, COVID-19 and you had mentioned that I was on the uh, NCAA advisory uh, panel for COVID-19, perhaps that'll be a topic that I can speak to or what are yes, your thoughts? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so you are the now, president. Well, hey, you got I got we got three presidents on this call here today. <laughs> so uh so uh 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 Ms. Brenda Yeager, uh, I'm gonna connect what you spoke to what I'm gonna to speak to. So uh beautiful song by the way. And uh so as president elect of the National Medical Association. I had the privilege of working with Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr. Uh, beginning around late March, early April as COVID-19 began to manifest uh, across the United States. And I had written a, an op-ed uh, called From Karina to Katrina, from Katrina to coronavirus, what have we learned? Next thing I know, I was invited to present on Santita Jackson's <coughs> syndicated uh, broadcast, <coughs> and then was asked to uh, recite that op-ed, and it was uh, broadcast during Resurrection Weekend during the Rainbow Push Coalition, Rainbow Push uh, program that a weekend, and as, as you know, that goes internationally. So now <laughs> I'm working with Reverend Jesse L. Jackson uh, and the Rainbow Push Coalition, and we draft a COVID-19 public health manifesto, a 12-point plan to address COVID-19. So, uh, now I'm going to uh, transition to the NCAA. There's a story behind that. So uh, Reverend Jackson uh, being concerned about the lack of transparency as it pertains to student athletes and uh, collegiate athletics and COVID-19 protocols, he convened a meeting with the president of the NCAA, uh, Dr. Mark Emmert, and the chief medical officer for the NCAA. And I was on that call. I helped draft the agenda and helped draft our points of concern and helped lead that discussion. And it was a fruitful discussion. They were able to uh, address our concerns and uh, 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 Ms. Brenda Yeager, next thing I know, <laughs> I'm on the NCAA <laughs> COVID-19 task force. And that's because uh, one of uh, the leaders of the Rainbow Push Coalition stated to the NCAA, uh, we think you should have a National Medical Association doctor uh, in your 
program. So, and 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 that's how that happened. So, and we've been able to provide input in regards to the protocol, uh, and especially the most recent one that was released on Wednesday, because we were concerned about uh, hearing how students were being asked to sign liability waivers, and we were concerned about whether students would have the uh, option to opt out of competition and would that result in loss of scholarship. So uh, I'll just go through a few of these points here. Dr. Maxey, that was, this was just released on Wednesday by the, uh, and endorsed by the NCAA, National Collegiate Athletic Association Board of uh, Trustees. So, and we were concerned about whistleblowers and would that be uh, an avenue for overzealous coaches, because you know how these coaches get sometimes. They want to get that competitive edge and, and, and may not follow the guidelines. So this is on the NCAA website also. It's entitled, Board Directs Each Division to Safeguard Student-Athlete Well-Being, Scholarships, and Eligibility. So I'll just pick out a, a number of these. I'm not going to read the whole document. So uh, the NCAA will establish a phone number and email to allow college athletes, parents, and others to report alleged failures. The association will notify school and conference administrators who will be expected to make, uh, take immediate action. All student athletes must be allowed to opt out of participation due to concerns about contracting COVID-19. If a college athlete chooses to opt out, that individual's athletic scholarship commitment must be honored by the college or university. And it goes on to state that member schools may not require student athletes to waive their legal rights regarding COVID-19 as a condition of athletic uh, participation. And we were also concerned about the insurance issue. So member schools in conjunction with existing insurance standards must cover COVID-19 related medical expenses for student athletes to prevent out-of-pocket expenses for college athletes uh, and their families. So, uh, so those are, I think, some of the uh, higher impact provisions that are included within that uh, uh, recommend or guideline or requirement from the NCAA that was just released on uh, Wednesday. And it was just uh, to be a part of that, to represent the National Medical Association, uh, I think, for me was, uh, and continue to do so, we have meetings twice weekly with this advisory panel. So uh, I think it sounds like I'm doing a lot of talking here. So I just wanted to maybe end there, uh, uh, Dr. Maxey, and uh, be open to any questions from the audience. And, well, thank you. Let me ask the first question while Judy is looking to see if we have questions in the chat box. As a family practitioner, and also as an administrator uh, at Ohio State University. Uh, what are your opinions about how we should send our young people uh, back to school and be at risk the, as well, the, not only the students, but the faculty? And in your area of private practice, what have you experienced with uh, COVID-19? Okay. So you got about three questions in there. <laughs> so let me, so let me speak to my experience as a family physician in Columbus, Ohio. That's the one I think I can most directly uh, answer. So since about March, we, so starting in March, we actually stopped most of our family physicians stopped seeing patients in person, and we went totally to telehealth and either via video or via conversations on the telephone, still using 
the electronic medical record. Uh, now, as of about a month or so ago, uh, we have transitioned back to seeing patients, but it's a hybrid. For me, I was I, so like you said, I'm doing all this administrative and research stuff. So I'm, I'm in the office like two half days a week and one Saturday per month. So what I've done for my practice, so uh, my Monday morning practice now is all virtual. It's either via video. Video is preferred because of higher reimbursement rates available and you get to see the patients and it's more of a connection uh, as compared to the telephone visits. And my after hours uh, clinic on Thursday to provide increased access to uh, people in the community and my uh, that's a in-person visit and so you got to see me when I, I I need to take a picture of that so I have this N95 mask on <laughs> and I have this face guard on and uh, I just and then you know I got this African nose and I'm like that thing is squeezing my nose <laughs> by the end of the day it's like Lord have mercy what is going on here <laughs> so it's 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 it, there's some personal discomfort wearing that N95 mask, but it's, it's the thing to do. I'm, I'm not trying to contract a COVID-19. And 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 a, and a patient story for you also, uh, 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 Dr. Maxey. So one of my patients, and this just speaks to what you were talking to in your presentation and, and the uh, latter presentation. So one of my patients was a former a uh, football player at Ohio State. This brother was like, you know, he looked like the mighty Hulk. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't, I'm not, he wasn't like, you know, he just was a big dude and looked like somebody you don't want to mess with, right? And he was muscular and all this kind of stuff. He, he contracted COVID-19 and he was in the uh, hospital for over a month. He was in the ICU. He lost a considerable amount of weight and uh, with uh, acute kidney injury. And uh, Dr. Maxey, he's 34 years old and now he's on dialysis. So when we talk about COVID-19 and the inflammatory cytokines and how it can damage your lungs, your kidneys, your organs, that's real. And, and so... So that's, I just saw him back in office last Thursday uh, for a follow-up. Uh, so he's doing well now, but you can just see how that COVID doesn't play and how that preventive strategy is really important. And, uh, uh, and he didn't have, he, he didn't have hypertension. He was, I, if you look at him, if you do the body mass index, he would have been defined as obese, but he's not so, he was just, a yeah. So maybe, so for him, the, I would think the the obesity risk factor was probably the most prevalent. Uh, but other than that, you would think, you wouldn't think that that amount of devastation would have happened to this young man from contracting uh, COVID-19. Yeah, like two other questions in <laughs> that one question too, Dr. Maxey. Okay, <laughs> so, well, uh, I was asking, what else, uh, as, <laughs> as, as an administrative person uh, at a major Big Ten university, uh, are they going back to school in person? Are they doing it uh, online? And what are your thoughts in general about the nation so they, so sending our kids well, back to school so there is a so so there's there's two, so now we're talking about a college campus and then when you say sending kids back to school that's the entire united states so let me let me let me maybe start with uh the college campus so there is a plan being developed for like stage re-entry of students uh, and uh, screening with uh, COVID-19 and also symptoms. That plan is still in development. So, uh, so that's where we stand right now. 
uh, as across the nation, the prevalence of COVID-19 infection is increasing in this is where uh, Columbus and Ohio State is located. We're in the red zone out of the four zones in regards to severity. So I think that's a that's that's to be determined uh, in regards to uh, the uh, local school system, uh, the Columbus City Schools, uh, uh, many of the suburban schools have opted for uh, online virtual classes for this first semester. And uh, based on our local health department recommendations and prevalence of COVID-19 uh, in our community. So I think looking at that prevalence in one's community and the ability to provide safeguards uh, at that school system, I think are things that uh, surely need to be considered. And uh, this is what's happening uh, here where I'm at in Ohio. Okay, my last question, and I'm gonna, uh, after I ask it, uh, can you really play football and be socially distanced. And I know our other past president, Dr. Richard Williams has written extensively on sudden death in black athletes. So I'm gonna ask him to make a comment too. But Ohio State is famous for its uh, 10 yards and a cloud of dust in football. But how can you play football without extreme exposure to other people? So what's happening here at the Ohio State is that uh, for the NCAA, the provision is for weekly testing of COVID-19 for COVID-19, uh, no more than 72 hours before competition. Uh, the Big Ten, and I'm not a spokesperson for the Big Ten, I'm the president of the National Medical Association. I'm not representing the Ohio State, I'm just sharing with you what I know, okay? So the uh, Big Ten has gone beyond that. They're testing twice weekly. They've eliminated uh, all competition for football outside of the conference. So it's going to be all conference. They've moved up the schedule. So the uh, Michigan game is going to occur October 24th instead of like the first week in November. Uh, so uh, and and. In this NCAA document, there are provisions stating that uh, that provide uh, guidelines on when competition should be discontinued. That's in that document also. So I think looking at the data, looking at the infection rates, and you do make a very good point about uh, collision sports and uh, proximity. I know one of the other things for the uh, NCAA that's being recommended. So what you're going to see is a lot of the athletes in football, in addition to the uh, face guard, there's going to be a, a plastic uh, covering uh, over uh, the uh, face mask. So uh, there are risks. Uh, you are pointing it out uh, absolutely right. Uh, so I don't disagree uh, in regards to uh, risk involved. So with the risk being involved, I would ask the members of the audience to uh, refer to that NCAA document concerning uh, eligibility for student athletes and its goals beyond uh, football. There's more than football involved in this also. So uh, uh, I think one of the things we wanted to help ensure that there, that there were safeguards and student athletes have an opportunity to opt out without losing their scholarship. So people are making decisions, uh, uh, but we didn't want that decision to be one of coercion or not having options. So uh, I think that athlete will have to have to have that discussion with their family, right? And decide on what's in their best interest. That's what we wanted to help ensure that the athletes have some rights. So I think with that discussion led by and convened by Reverend Jesse Jackson, there are some rights on the table now through the NCAA. 
Uh, so you make some very good points. I, I hope this is informative and helpful what I'm answering. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williams, would you comment on that issue of uh, the contact sports or used on? Is Dr. Williams on? Dr. Jordan? Yeah, I am. Yes. I'd like to make a comment if we can. I'm here. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, before I make a comment on your, your uh, question that I was appointed to answer, uh, I'd like to say something to Dr. McDougall first and ask him a question. Uh, the uh, first thing that I want to do for uh, Dr. McDougall is to congratulate you on assuming the presidency of our, our vaunted, uh, uh, vaunted uh, National Medical Association. And thank you so much for giving that excellent history of the NMA and for all that you do for NMA for all of us. The second thing after the congratulations is that I wanna a, give a shout out to your colleague and mine, Dr. Quinn Capers yeah. at, at the Ohio State University who taught me to say the Ohio State, <laughs> not just Ohio State. And uh, he's a great cardiologist, uh, as you know, at uh, the Ohio State. And the last thing about that, this is um, in regards to, uh, uh, I guess you'd say a, a word of, of sympathy. Uh, your loss is our gain. You lost, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Drake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like you just that's like uh, my old friend and yours, yeah. and great great doctor, who has just recently become the first black president in the history of the University of California system, yeah. and we're yeah. really so proud and happy to have him back because, as you know, he was yeah. in California for quite a while before he came to you. Uh, now. In answer to uh, uh, Dr. Maxey's question, uh, I'll answer that very briefly. Uh, there is no information so far that black athletes suffer a worse fate uh, from COVID-19 than other athletes. However, as you know, black athletes do have a propensity uh, for having a greater incidence of sudden cardiac death as I've detailed in, in a couple of my books. And uh, we would not be surprised if, especially with the cardiovascular effects of COVID-19, if, if that became more pronounced as we get more evidence. I do wanna mention something about the cardiovascular aspect of COVID-19, which everybody needs to recognize. And that is that uh, there is a, uh, a propensity for increased blood coagulation to occur and for clots to form uh, to the extent that we see many more strokes and these seem to occur much more in African-Americans and in Latino Latinx individuals than in others. So uh, the, the lesson here is if you see a, a patient who uh, for mysterious reasons or unknown reasons develops a sudden stroke, especially if they're under the age of 50 and are black, uh, that uh, you should suspect that that person may be COVID-19 positive and proceed on that basis. And also, uh, I believe that uh, patients who especially uh, enter the second phase and beyond of COVID-19, that they uh, should be considered to be placed on uh, anticoagulant medications because of the changes that occur in blood coagulation in many of the patients with it with COVID-19 and that may forestall the development of strokes. Uh, the last thing that I want to do is to ask Dr. McDougall another question uh, which is something that I know that he's been looking into and this has to do with something that affects every black physician in the United States. Uh, uh, has to do with a paper which was uh, presented in March in the Journal of the American Heart Association by a Dr. Wang, which was on the subject of uh, diversity in uh, medicine and particularly 
uh, took a slap at every black doctor by suggesting that we are not as competent, not as capable, not as intelligent, and not as deserving as uh, physicians of other stripes are. Uh, I wanted to uh, call everybody's attention to that paper because as I said, it impugns every black doctor in this country. And I know that the NMA has plans to uh, very uh, firmly address that. Uh, the Association of Black Cardiologists has already sent out a paper uh, in uh, response to that. But this is something that we all need to be aware of, that COVID-19 is unmasking a lot of things, including all of the racism that exists in this country and the hatred. And we, we have to be aware of it and have to constantly be vigilant uh, because we are always going to be under attack. We can never be comf comfortable and uh, complacent. And uh, I just wanted to ask Dr. McDougall to address that, especially from his status as our president. Yes, uh, very uh, good question. So that paper was sent to me by uh, our good uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Gabby. And uh, on about March the 30th, uh, subsequently, after receiving that, Dr. Quinn Capers and I met in my office to discuss rebuttal. So as you know, uh, uh, Dr. Williams, a lot of discussion has been going on with the uh, American College of Cardiology, Medical Association uh, AHA uh, and uh, with me being president-elect at the time of the National Medical Association. So this, the interesting thing about this uh, paper is that it clearly shows that he knows nothing about American history. He right. knows nothing about black history and, uh, and and he, he wants to start his discussion on uh, black doctors uh, in the 60s. And then the rebuttal I started to write and, and sit to Quinn and to hopefully incorporate in what was being done is that, uh, as I spoke to you today, this started in 1870. So, no, and, and in 1963, 5,000 black doctors. 227,000 uh, European American doctors. And, uh, and and you had to go through the AMA to get specialty training. So you had doctors such as Dr. Williams who was able to break through all that to get specialty training, right? You, you and, 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 and this is, <laughs> so, the apology, just take, take a guess of when you think the AMA apologized for that discrimination. The NMA members know, National Medical Association members know, 2008. Right. So we go from 1870 to 2008 without this even being acknowledged. And then you have, it's understandable though, uh, Dr. Williams, because it's that institutionalized systemic race, racism shows you have an immigrant coming here from China and he's probably hearing all these things from others. Yep. He's probably watching Fox News every night, <laughs> hearing us, <laughs> hearing about various negative things about people of color. So, uh, so apparently he's not, <laughs> and he probably has this limited scope of people that he even relates to. So he's going to get on his high horse and start writing some, something about he, he knows nothing about. Okay. And so, then, gentlemen, I think we do need to definitely knock this guy down. The whole reason for the Black Health Trust was to present Black doctors to our community with credible information. And the reason that I wanted you to introduce the NMA, which you so did so well, 
was mm -hmm. I'm trying to show our people who we really are and the capabilities and qualities that our doctors have. And they've been treated to a number uh, of competent black physicians over the past few months addressing this. So this fits right in. We know that yes. people like this Dr. Wang, I won't comment on his name. Uh, we have to disregard uh, people like that, but I do believe you have to strike early. I'm gonna get the question in by Dr. Jordan uh, on the issue uh, of contact sports and spread of infection. And I know there's another uh, famous infectious disease uh, physician and epidemiologist on the line as well. And I'm going to invite her to comment if she will. Uh, Dr. Jesse, go ahead, Dr. Jordan. My concern about this, can you hear me? Yes. A lot of these kids are coming from financially disadvantaged environments and their families often are hoping they make it, et cetera. Youth feel like they're indestructible. And many, as we see in HIV all the time, and we're still seeing it, young people didn't think it would ever happen to them until it happens to them. If someone gets COVID, one of the problems, most of them do not recover back to where they were. You may recover, but you may be at 95% or 90% of where you were. Very rarely is it at 100%. And that's a big chance they're taking. I can't imagine football without, without being able to have contact. And if there needs to be certain parameters set, but if there's a spike in the city, or in the city from which people are coming, I wouldn't want my son to be playing. And I would tell him, no. But I know a lot of kids may be under pressure from their families to play because that's their way out of what they, they think of poverty. Uh, so I, I'm not too eager. Football is the biggest money maker for colleges, particularly the Big Ten, Southeast, et cetera. That was a billion dollar industry. And they can do everything they can every way they can to be able to make the money. I'm not gonna call it a modern day slavery, but it is the interest is in the owners in the administration, not the athletes. And the athletes don't have much representation from their perspective, unless you have parents and they may need to come and say it. At this year, we recommend you don't play, simple as that. I wouldn't want my kids to be playing this year, not in football. But I like to know what journal was this article written? Because I really would care about someone. We've had white doctors saying that for a hundred years. So nothing new that some doctor says something. Richard Williams is here, you're here, McDougal is here, I'm here. That proves the opposite. So why waste our time on some idiot saying something? who probably got paid some money, just as someone is paying Kanye money to run for president. You can always have folks on the other side trying to destroy things. Don't lose track of where we're going, period. I mean, I don't, I don't care if someone thinks I'm inferior. If you think that, then go to some other doctor. Yeah. I've only had that happen once, and that was, I was the only doctor there in the hospital. So it's a, I don't wanna, I think, your answer is solved. You don't want a black doctor? You better go to another hospital. Let, let you know, me, I guess I take that. So no, you ain't got to guess to take me. I don't want you. Let me you make know, Don't a, ask me, am I qualified to take care of you? I'll ask you, are you qualified for me to take care of? It's a two-way street. Dr. Jordan. I think we have to also have our own self-pride. Dr. Jordan. Brenda, thank Dr. God for you, my favorite song by you and Jerry Butler. Uh, let me ask a question to the physicians on the phone. Judy, look at the, the chat box. But I remember when I was a junior in medical school, I got invited by the associate dean of the College of Medicine at Harvard School of Medicine to come and visit 
an interview. And Dr. Richard Williams, who at that time was the Associate Dean of Harvard University College of Medicine, and invited me. And on that trip, I got interviewed by a young uh, gentleman who had hair at Beth Israel, whose name was Dr. Wilbur Jordan, uh, who was a highly regarded uh, resident at the time, who interviewed me. I also met uh, a young, beautiful lady at the time named Dr. Vivian Penn, who was Associate Dean of the College of Medicine and Assistant Director of Pathology at the New England Tufts School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. McDougall is faculty at Ohio State. Uh, we've had on the call one of the original people, Dr. Jesse Sherrod, who's also a graduate of Harvard University College of Medicine. We've had any number of exceedingly, exceedingly competent, well-documented physicians. Dr. Williams has two books both of which have been accepted into the African American Museum of History. We know that in getting to where we got, most of us were way ahead of our Caucasian counterparts at our same level, both in terms of knowledge, intellect, drive. And I'll tell you, uh, I wouldn't think of going to a Caucasian physician over a black physician. I'm not saying that there are not good white physicians, there are, but we have the cream of the cream and mo most of us are equal or better qualified than people of our same rank. So I salute the members who have come on and given up their time to talk to uh, our people. Judy, are there any uh, questions in the chat box? And are there any other NMA members who care to comment briefly? And I want to get Dr. Tyler back on. Yeah, this is Dr. Sherrod. You, you did. I can't hear you. This is Dr. Sherrod. How are you? Hello, Dr. Sherrod. Can you all hear me? Yeah, I, I just want to um, congratulate Dr. McDougall um, for taking the uh, job as president of the National Association. I think it's very important. I wanted to commend you on your job. I can't hear you very well, Dr. Sherrod. Uh, okay, I don't know what's going on with my computer. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Uh, concerning, I, I'd like to say that I agree completely with Dr. Jordan on the contact sports. And I think we have to be very uh, vigilant and very careful about the situations that we allow our kids to get into because underline, remember this is a capitalistic country. The bottom line is money even over lives. And we're seeing that in clear daylight now from coming from our president. Um, and so it bothers me that in spite of the out of control pandemic that we have here in America, we're trying to send our kids to school. I mean, force them to go back to school without using any guidelines. So I, I'm really disturbed and I agree with Dr. Jordan on that, I won't repeat that. But the other thing that bothers me is the amount of uh, death that we're having in the United States. And I think part of it is due to, a large part of it is due to the disorgani disorganization that we have at the federal level. We do not have a national federal plan. And I think, I wanted to ask Dr. McDougall, I think we need to come out as an organization, the NMA, the AMA, the ABC, and everybody else, and just send a letter to the White House or to whom it should go to concerning the lack of organization in an effort to control this epidemic. The focus is on economics, getting the guys to play ball. They can test the NBA every day and have them play ball and make money for the nation, but then they're gonna send our kids to school with no testing plan in place and without the money to even set up social distancing. It takes money to go back to school and change the environment so that it's safe for our children. But I wanted to commend both Dr. Maxey and Dr. Towler for their presentations and then get back to this nutritional thing because I think it's underplayed in our education and medicine in the United States. 
And that's the other thing. You know, we think we can eat anything we, we want, do anything we want, and then the doctor can fix it with the pharmaceuticals because the pharmaceuticals make money. Nutrition is very, very important. It is the bottom line. And some famous doctor said, I don't remember his name, but at the bottom of every diagnosis, every illness, there's a nutritional deficiency. I mean, food is the medicine, but we haven't been trained that way. So we're now being trained to utilize the food in trying to heal people in this United States. It's called functional medicine, which Dr. Tola talk, talked about. And we have to remember, I think part of the morbidity and mortality that we're seeing from the, uh, the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic has to do with the nutritional status of the American public. The standard American diet stands for SAD. It's the most deadly diet in the world and they are spreading it all over the world. So I'm sure that's a major factor. I don't have a randomized control study to show you that, and I don't have the scientific backup, but I suspect that our status has a lot to do with the mortality and the morbidity that all of us are experiencing, not just African-Americans, but Caucasian-Americans too, looking if you compare them to the European Caucasian Ameri uh, populations. So nutrition, I cannot overemphasize. And the other thing I wanna say is that Ramen techniques in the United States has depleted the soil of minerals. And that's why you have to take supplements. I think there was a question about food versus supplements. You can eat organic all you want, but if the food is depleted of mineral, the soil is depleted of minerals, your organically grown foods lack pesticides, but no minerals. And Dr. Norton back in 1930, I think it was, testified before the U.S. Senate. It's called U.S. Senate 264. You can Google it. At that time, in 1930, he told the American Senate that the farming techniques in the United States has depleted the soil of minerals, and if we don't replace them, we're going to get a lot of illness, and that's exactly what we're experiencing now. And I think COVID-19 has been a magnifying glass for all of the problems, many of the problems that we have here in this capitalistic, richest country in the world with the worst outcome from COVID-19 for many reasons, but that. Uh, Stuart, thank you for your, your comments. Those are right on time. Uh, Dr. Tyler, I, I want you to comment a bit more on nutrition, but first let me see what's in the chat box. Okay, in the chat box, we have a uh, request for uh, the uh, journal where the article from this Dr. Wang was stated, if anybody has that, if they could put it in the uh, chat box. Heart also, there is a Please. American Heart Association, and it was retracted, so you may not be able to find it. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then there's a uh, statement about the relationship between smoking and COVID-19 and the various reasons hypothesized for including the anti-inflammatory activity of nicotine or the antiviral effect of nitric oxide. Does anyone have any information about that? Okay, Dr. Tyler, you want to start off and uh, I invite others to chime in on that? There are uh, theories about that. Oh, let's go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the, the first data was from New York City, where it was interesting that smokers, which we all assumed would have a higher rate than non-smokers, and it was the opposite. And no one knows why. I don't know if it was the heat that made you may see more of heat in the lung because you're smoking or the carbon monoxide. No one really knows what is caused that, but it's also confirmed here in LA, it's the, the number who have difficult cases is less among smokers than non-smokers. Uh, the obese and diabetics whose sugar is out of control are the two big things. And there's no reason to be weighing 350 pounds and we need to do that, do something to get our people to lose some weight. If you go to China, Japan, anywhere in Southeast Asia, you rarely will see anyone overweight and they have plenty of food. So we can enjoy food, but we don't have to look like a hippo and drag. I mean, it's just ridiculous how many of our kids are like that. We, we need to stop. And we don't need to get up in the morning with a blood sugar of 340. I mean, that's our problem. That's our fault. We can do a better job of managing. 
and we need to do that. This thing likes sugar. You're right, it likes sugar. So when you wake up and your blood sugar is already 300 and you haven't eaten the bacon or anything, you get sick. And if you are exposed, it's, it's, it's gonna go crazy. I mean, there are things we can do to minimize the effect of it if we inhale it. And losing weight and controlling our blood sugar are two things that we need to be doing ourselves. Let me speak a minute on blood sugar. Uh, many people eat a dessert called creme brulee. And no. creme brulee is like a custard. And it's got a, a glaze over the top, which is made out of sugar. And the way they make that glaze is with a blowtorch melting the sugar. Mm -hmm. And chemically, it's called a glycosylate. So when you eat sugar and it elevates your blood sugar, the blowtorch is your body temperature of 98.6. And it turns that sugar into something we can measure called hemoglobin A1C. And it converts that glycosylated sugar into, I'm gonna take a liberality with what it does, into little spicules of plastic, which can enter the tissue of your blood vessels and make, uh, make it more stiff. It's called vascular stiffness, can make the, the basis of atherosclerosis. But also it ultimately can contribute to the increase in centripetal obesity and fat. And there may be something like 50 different hormones that get increased uh, and decrease your insulin uh, uh, resistance and everything. And this increases the number of things that can cause the so-called cytokine. So no, it, it all becomes a perfect storm metabolically in sugar. I agree with Dr. Uh, Sherrod and Dr. Tyler and also Dr. Jordan that there's a whole met metabolic storm that we're exposed to that has to do with how we respond to this disease. And part of the problem with the uh, cytokine storm and the respiratory disease is that we have been conditioned metabolically for 400 years uh, with not only sugar, but poisoning the systems and becoming more labeled. Now, just because I'm not paranoid does not mean everybody's not out to get me. I don't necessarily believe in conspiracy theory, but I think there's a lot of conspiracy uh, willful or by neglect going on, and it's going to affect our people more uh, than that. Is there anything in the chat box? And I wanted Dr. Tyler to make a nutritional comment. Judy? Yes, there's a um, question about vitamin C recommendations and vitamin D3 recommendations. Dr. Tyler? Okay, um, the vitamin D recommendation is that you take 5,000 IUs per day, now, if you haven't been, uh, the ideal thing is to get your vitamin D level measured right. and then to see where you are. An, an ideal level, uh, particularly for COVID, is 40 to 60 um, nanograms per, per milliliter. But we know that even higher levels are protective of, against cancer, in particular prostate cancer, like levels at the level of 90. So the labs usually go up to like 30 to 55. Um, so 40 to 60 is considered a good range um, for protection, but you can aim for even higher. Uh, if people have not been, if they're low, then generally it's recommended that they start with 50,000 units. Um, and then they start taking the, the 5,000 a week. But that's something that can be measured. So I would recommend getting that measured. As far as the vitamin C goes, um, it's recommended that you take like two grams a day. And there are different types that you can take. Um, there's one that's liposomal called liposomal vitamin C. And so it's encapsulated by a fat capsule. So it's better absorbed. Um, but there are also ones that are powders that go up to like 5,000 milligrams like per, per teaspoon. So you can get those as well. Just stay away from the ones that have the sugar. 
even though those are the good tasting ones. Is uh, Admiral Brewer on? Admiral David Brewer? Dr. Dr. Yes. Maxey, uh, this is Dr. Yes, Dr. Strong. Uh, I just had one other addition to what Dr. Jordan was saying about the obesity that exists in our population and the teenage population in America in general. And I agree that we should take a 100 responsibility for our own health. But also we have to educate the public that the food that's being produced is also being produced to produce money. So take, for example, the high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup was put into the Americas by the Japanese. And sometimes I wonder whether it was actually food warfare because the, the, the stuff is deadly and it was in everything. And it causes, a, it contributes a great deal to diabetes and to obesity. So we have to be aware of the additives that are being put in the processed foods that actually addicts us to eating. And people be trying to stop eating and they can't because they're addicted to these additives that are added to the processed foods. So that's another thing we need to be aware of. Of course, yeah. we try to lose weight, but you also need to know what to eat and what's good for you. And it's very difficult. In and Dr. Maxey, I would just like to chime in that high fructose cor corn syrup is not metabolized well in the body, but also it leads to an inactive form of vitamin D. So that can also lead to vitamin D deficiency. So and that's why, something that why everybody why vitamin, needs to be aware of. Why is vitamin D so important to our bodies and especially black men? Uh, vitamin D is considered a hormone now because it affects so many areas of the body. Uh, just about every endocrine, you know, we, we think about individual hormones, but they act, they act all together. So of course, you know, vitamin D is how you get your calcium absorbed, um, you know, your, your magnesium, at least the bone strength, bone health. Um, of course, one of the big morbidities as people get older is when they fracture from falls and then that leads to complications. So, but they're, you know, it's involved in hormone production. There, there's so many levels and black people tend to be more resistant. What people need to know is the sun activates vitamin D to a particular form of vitamin D and then the kidneys activate it to the final activated form. So because of the melanin in our skin, we tend to get less of the activation from the sun. Also, we're wearing sunscreen and hats and, and things like that. So that's where vitamin D supplementation becomes very important. Is Dr. Norris on the phone? Dr. Keith Norris? Dr. Maxine, uh, the Admiral is on also now. Admiral Brewer, how are you, sir? Ad Admiral Brewer is a... Uh, retired vice admiral of the U.S. Navy uh, and under his control or command, I guess not control, but command, were the Navy hospital ships to comfort and the mercy. But more importantly now, he takes care of his 100-year-old mother with superior nutrition. Uh, admiral Brewer, would you give us a, a brief comment on what you do? Um, Randall, this is uh, Jim Johnson, Admiral Johnson. Admiral. I didn't see Admiral Brewer on the list, but I'm on the list. Okay, Admirals and Admiral. And, uh, let me introduce you. Admiral uh, Johnson is a retired uh, Admiral. He's a surgeon. He was a commander of uh, the Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego and administrator of the uh, TRICARE, which is the Armed Forces uh, uh, Healthcare insurance. Uh, uh, he's a gentleman that I've known a long time. Only one question I have, Admiral. You were in the Navy, but you're a Marine. Is that true? Hoorah, absolutely. I was medical officer of the Marine Corps, worked for two commandants, and spent half my career with the Marines. Uh, Navy Medical Department takes care of other Marines. The Marines do not have their own uh, medical groups. So, um, Navy corpsmen are assigned with Marines. Marines never took a hill not in sight of, America, uh, of a Navy corpsman. Uh, if you look at the Marine Corps Memorial, one of the uh, 
individuals um, raising the uh, flag over Mount Suribachi is a second-class pharmacist mate. So there is no other military service that reveres its medical people like the Marine Corps. Well, very good. Very good. I'm so glad to see you. So glad to see you. And uh, Dr. Good Dr. Dr. Maxey? Yes. Dr. Maxey. Yes, Dr. So, Dr. As a point of privilege, I'd just like to commend uh, Admiral uh, Johnson. He met with my wife and I before we went out to deployment, uh, six month deployment at sea. I've been trying to track him down and there's a blessing here. So uh, Admiral Johnson, I, this is uh, Leon McDougal. I just wanna uh, thank you for your advice and mentoring throughout the years. And uh, so glad to see you here today. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I wanna congratulate you. When you went out on that depo deployment, Years and years ago, I knew that uh, you would come back and you would do great things, which you have done. Well, one thing that uh, Admiral Johnson did for me, uh, President McDougal, uh, when I got installed as president, uh, he invited every uh, African-American physician general officer of the U.S. military who was a physician. And I think there were 32 uh, general officers, and, which includes admirals. And we had, I think, something like 25 show up. Uh, we had the Navy band uh, play. It was a, a night that I will never forget at the National Medical. That might be a good thing uh, to do in New Orleans, uh, Brother President. It was very good and unifying and uh, a lot of people showed up and all in uniform. It was a, a beautiful thing. Uh, are there any questions in the chat box, Judy? Uh, there's a question about um, can you take too much vitamin D? Dr. Tyler, are any other physicians on the phone want to address that? That's why it's important to get a vitamin D level because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin and you can't overdose on it. Your level should be less than 80. If you get up to 80, you're getting into the toxic range. But Dr. Maxey, uh, I had a question for Dr. McDougall concerning the NMA and African-American physicians and what we can do to try to get more African-American patients into the clinical trials and for the vaccine, but also for therapeutics. You know, we are getting all these new drugs coming out and we're gonna have these vaccines coming out. And we know that there is a genetic difference in how people act and in, react individually to different uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals. And that's true with vaccines too. So I'm just wondering if there's any plan in the National Medical Association to deal with educating one physicians on how and encouraging them to get, them, uh, get their patients into the clinical trials. And I know that it's a big issue because of the distrust and all of that, but we still have to function within this United States and we still may have to take the vaccine. But we need to know how we react. So we need to have some of our people in there in the clinical trials. And I'm just- okay. I got your question. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah. very good question. So uh, President, former President Doris Brown is leading our initiative on Project Impact in regards to clinical trials. I have, I'm convening a presidential commission on COVID-19 and people of color. And part of that will be uh, bringing in experts to speak to uh, vaccines and therapeutics as it pertains to COVID-19. I'm presently uh, putting together a panel for our Congressional Black Caucus uh, initiative uh, upcoming in September, where I'm going to, uh, my proposed uh, title is uh, Debunking Deep State conspiracies concerning <laughs> COVID-19 uh, and uh, vaccination, immunization. So uh, as you know, there are a lot of conspiracy uh, uh, tales out there on the web in addition to what you spoke to to uh, discourage uh, uh, people of color, especially from participating in uh, clinical trials and also even receiving uh, the vaccine. And, and one of the uh, theories uh, is surrounding uh, alpha interferon. So we're going to be speaking to that also 
uh, on this panel. So that's going to be upcoming in September with our uh, collaborative initiative with the Congressional Black Caucus. So very good questions. So that would be coming out through the NMA. We'll find out through the NMA? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is Dr. Jordan. We're doing two studies at the OASIS Clinic, two vaccine studies. Fantastic. Dr. Maxey. Yes. Uh, Dr. Williams, I'd like to uh, weigh in on uh, that point that uh, was made in regards to uh, the vaccines and, and the clinical trials. Uh, just to give a couple of statistics that are relevant. Uh, number one is that Blacks are 13% of the general population in the United States, but only 5% of Blacks participate in clinical trials, not because they don't want to, but because they aren't recruited to. Uh, Latinx individuals are 18% of the general population, but only 1% of the clinical trial population. Now, um, to cut to the chase, there is an organization and a mechanism we're recruiting individuals in the clinical trials, which I'm sure that Dr. McDougal is aware of, but everybody needs to be aware of. So that uh, to answer Dr. Sherrod's point, uh, there is a way to get people into the trials. Uh, it, there is a, uh, an organization called the uh, COVID-19 Prevention Network. COVID-19 Prevention Network, uh, abbreviated COVPN. And it's located at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. There's a gentleman named Stefan Wa Wallace, who is the director of external relations. Now, I'm, I'm sure that everybody couldn't write all that down. If you need more information on that in regards to where to direct uh, doctors and patients uh, to get into the clinical trials, I'll be able to provide that if you contact me through Dr. Maxey. Randall. Yes. Let me just add to Richard's statement. It's also important that you have minorities as researchers. It's very hard for a lot of black kids. We'll use AIDS for a good example. Most of the researchers were white and they were looking for black participants and they didn't think about us until the research, the company started saying we need more blacks. Then suddenly they wanted to colonialize us. But before then, we could be at a meeting and they weren't thinking about us. So I think that's important that we also be a part. It's hard for someone who has not been around that many white folks to suddenly feel comfortable in a research setting, period. Right. And I it's think that's important. Enough. But you need to have blacks doing the research too. Exactly. Is there Dr. Jordan Desfany on the phone? Dr. Jordan? Is Dr. Jordan Desfany, PAC? No. That would be Despani. Is he on the line? I don't think so. Okay, he's a young gentleman, a researcher. I met a PhD from Louisiana who has extensive research experience in uh, coronavirus. We're talking to him about uh, something we're doing. Is Dr. Motley on? He was. He was, but I think he's off now. Okay. Um, let's go around the table with the physicians who are on. Are there any other questions that we can ask for our general panel? We're getting close to our sign off time. I'd like to, to ask, yes, uh, make yes. a comment and uh, uh, to respond to any questions about it. And the comment is about something that I think Dr. Sherrod mentioned earlier um, and uh, has to do with uh, nitric acid. Uh, nitric, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. Yeah. oxide not nitric acid. That's, nitric that's oxide. tough, buddy. <laughs> that's a lot of difference. Right. Uh, nitric oxide is an, a, a very essential substance in our bodies and is responsible for dilatation of blood vessels. Uh, if there's a deficiency of that substance, hypertension often results as a result of vasoconstriction. And uh, it's a well-known fact now that African-Americans have a general deficiency of nitric oxide. And uh, might be, that might be one of the reasons for the increased amount of hypertension in Blacks. In any event, 
Uh, this is something that underlies what I think underlies uh, the entire uh, problem of uh, in medicine in, in disease. I think inflammation is the underlying issue in all disease mm -hmm. in the body. It's inflammation. And it's something that we have to address and combat. Uh, nitric oxide may be the critical link here. And it's something that I think uh, all physicians need to think about. And Dr. Maxey, I remember years ago, you were vitally interested in this in regards to a, uh, a promotion that you were carrying out regarding a substance that promoted nitric oxide. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. let me speak on that just a moment. Uh, nitric oxide, as Dr. Williams mentioned, is a severely important subject. It helps to heal something called the endothelium, which yes. is the inside lining of your blood vessels. That inside lining, if you were to take those cells and lay them end to end, would take up over six tennis courts in terms of the amount. So that's a pretty big organ. Nitric oxide, uh, we used to think it, it came primarily from something called L-arginine. Well, L-arginine has to go through some metabolic steps to generate nitric oxide. And Blacks may have a lack of that enzyme, which is called nitric oxide synthase. But when you get to green vegetables, and when you get to leafy green vegetables and micronutrients, the nitric oxide is a, an inorganic process to make. It exists as a gas. So what Dr. Tyler was saying that if you just take a handful of greens and eat that five times a day, you will get your supply of nitric oxide inorganically. So, and that does act as an antioxidant it gets rid of reactive oxygen. <laughs> so it is very healing. So I didn't understand that when I was a kid, but eat your greens. I'm saying Popeye had something on the ball. Eat that spinach. It's probably better raw. And collard uh, greens. <laughs> <laughs> and collard greens. So eat your greens. That's an extremely important thing, uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, so I'd like Dr. Uh, Tyler, you want to add something to that? Is she on? I think she's on, but she's muted. Uh, yeah, I have a sticky mouse. Um, yeah, I would just like to say that that may pertain to the issue of the smokers, that if their nit nitrous oxide levels are elevated, then that may be how they're escaping some of the ravaging from the COVID virus, because we know that the COVID virus also attacks the endothelium because the um, the ACE2 receptor is also in the endothelium. And so now there's some postulating that maybe this is more of a vascular disease. So, um, but I also wanna to emphasize too, with what um, the, doctor, the doctor said about inflammation, that all disease starts with inflammation. And what you should rem remember is that sugar causes inflammation. Sugar causes endothelial damage. Um, the mechanism of the um, COVID SARS-2 is that it causes endothelial damage. And that's what leads to, you know, superoxides and ox oxidation, which leads to the cytokine storm and the von Willebrand's factor decrease, which leads to the clotting. So it's a whole cascade that's starting from inflammation. So if you think of sugar as inflammation, the next time you think about eating that cookie, or eating that piece of cake. Just think about what it's doing to your body and ask yourself, when you put food in your body, ask yourself, is this helping me or is it hurting me? Because it's gonna do one or the other thing. And, and that is so critical. So if everybody could do just one thing that I mentioned in my talk, whether it's reducing your sugar, whether it's staying away from the refined oils. And I forgot to mention that um, the best oils to cook with are, are actually, coconut oil, avocado oil, or ghee. And olive oil should be reserved for really um, salads or low heat. But if you can do one thing today, everybody's health could improve starting today. Just take one of those items. Great. Um, Dr. Before Tyler. I Dr. Tyler. Dr. Before I recognize Dr. Fajay, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Tyler, is there any 
less um, <clears throat> glucose in peach cobbler or blackberry cobbler? Is there what? It, well, no, I'm just blackberries have a lower glycemic matter. index, but the sugar is going to kill you anyway. So, <laughs> uh, unless you take it. Hey. Which brings up another thing, though the sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, they're all bad. Right. Okay, they trick the body into, into hey. thinking that you're full and you're not, and it makes you more hungry. Um, the best uh, sweeteners to use, their sugar is sugar is sugar. However, maple syrup tends to raise the insulin level less than the other sugars, but sugar will still raise your insulin level. So that's the thing we have to like really, really mm -hmm. reduce. That's the thing that's killing us the most. Okay, I'd like to recognize Dr. Walter Frege. Raw hey, sugar. That's great. Hey, <laughs> congratulations, Dr. McDougall. Um, and really thank you uh, for bringing to our attention uh, that erroneous article in JAMA which Dr. Williams and ABC and everybody's gotten together. Did you guys talk about that earlier? Yeah. yeah. But, okay, good. Uh, but we will be talking about this. There are a couple other issues we'll be talking about on Thursday. Uh, but again, thank you for your leadership. Uh, I think the way you've addressed that issue gives us some indication of a, a very powerful, effective uh, presidency. And we on the Council of Educational Affairs are ready and willing uh, to help you. So I hope you can make the call Thursday night, Dr. McDougall. Will you be available? Are you sending out the link or what? Yeah, I'm sending the link out. Is Dr. McDougal still on? Yeah, he's still on. Okay. Yeah, I'll be sending the link out uh, tomorrow uh, with the agenda. Okay? And uh, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, my, my, my other mentor. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Judy, are there any, any other questions in the chat box we should address? Uh, there is a lengthy statement about UVC light and um, also by a far UVC light. So it's that, too that long mean, to read, but that's an issue that we got. Dr. Uh, Motley must be on the phone. Is he on, Dr. Motley? Yeah, he's on. Dr. Motley? Sure, but I didn't put anything in the chat box. You didn't? <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, now that you're there, you want to give a, a one-minute version of, of what you and Dr. Williams and Dr. Crary and I are doing yeah. to treat COVID quickly? Uh, as you know, and everyone knows now because of the television uh, uh, announcement that far UVC kills uh, the SARS-CoV-2 a virus. It also kills or inactivates other viruses. It kills bacteria. And uh, what we have been doing is trying to figure out a way to use it to clear the virus out of the lungs. Well, I'm a biomedical engineer who went to medical school. So I have E degrees and biomedical degrees. So we uh, well, myself, I have numerous patents on how to use UV in the ocean for communications in the open environment and communications in fog. And when you nebulize the lungs, most people do it with some type of bronchial dilator, uh, you create a fog mist in your trachea all the way down into your alveoli. And there is a phenomenon known as Tyndale scattering. And scattering allows light to be absorbed by colloidal particles at one frequency and emitted at another frequency. We found that a dense saline solution irradiated with far UV uh, wavelength light. It'll travel around corners into little crevices. It'll go everywhere there is a, a dense fog. So we're trying to use that as a means of getting the far UV into the lungs. Once, I'm going to ask you one, one question, and I, I wonder if you can answer it. Was one of your devices used to find bin Laden? <laughs> uh, 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 man, you know you can't talk about that. 
Are there any other questions in the chat box, Judy? Great. Okay, I'm going to ask our speakers, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Tyler. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Dr. Maxey, before you uh, do that, may I ask a question of yes. the Dr. Dr. Tyler? My name is Lamont Gibson. I'm a pharmacist on the call. And I'm just curious to know, and to, to Dr. Richard Allen Williams' point yes. about inflammation, uh, curcumin or turmeric, uh, what position does that have in terms of dealing with the kind of ravages of inflammation, not just in COVID, but also in, you know, cardiac disorders, uh, digestive disorders, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, there have been a lot of studies with curcumin, and it's, it's found to be a very potent anti-inflammatory agent. I actually mentioned it as one of the nutraceuticals that, uh, is used, that can be useful in the prevention and or treatment of COVID. So it's an, it's an all around um, very potent anti-inflammatory agent. So, I mean, it, it's, its uses are, if you look at the Indians, the Indian population, they have a low incidence of heart disease. And that, can, that, that might be attributable to the fact that they eat so much uh, curcumin. That East Indian or Native American Indian? East, East Indian. East Indian. East Thank Indian. you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we go to our final round with our speakers, uh, Judy, would you make that announcement? Yes, I will. I'm a proud member of the Black Health Trust family whose mission is to provide credible information and insight for our community health experts. And we are grateful to the numerous health professionals that have donated their time and their dynamic summary program recommendations to us. Our goal is to inform and help people of color become and stay healthy. Black Health Trust is developing the structure for a well-managed nonprofit organization and our continued success depends on your contributions. Please consider a modest donation or more as every dollar counts. Visit our website, blackhealthtrust.org to donate and we have many options available for you there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have production costs that are uh, going on as we do this. We hope we're giving uh, welcomed and credible information that's useful uh, to our communities and we want to expand it. We've had as many as 7,000 viewers on this program uh, that from the streaming on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, and we have a good crew of, of people I want to give credit to for helping us uh, put this on and we're trying to grow it more. We think the information is very useful. So anything you can do in that regard uh, would help spread the word. Uh, we do need a few uh, donations uh, and we thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Tyler, any final words? Yes, I would say, look at your diet, take a strong look at your diet, be honest with yourself and cut out the crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, really be honest with yourself about what you're eating and just decide maybe one thing a week that you will stop eating and pare things down mainly to vegetables and a small amount of meat is okay and limit limit the carbs um and just you know like someone said food is medicine and let medicine be thy food we are what we eat we are what we think and don't forget about sleep and exercise and do wear your masks because it has been shown that it reduces the viral load. And, and that's the main goal is to reduce the viral load. Thank you. Dr. So everybody be safe. Uh, yes, well, thanks Dr. Maxi for inviting me to present this uh, afternoon. And as we talk about policy, uh, my recommendation, and I know most people on this phone will, but uh, vote, those are my parting words. <laughs> Make America great again. Uh, as a speaker, my, my final words are, I believe we're in for a long haul with this COVID. 
I think it is even more important than ever uh, to emphasize continuing to wear masks, to be able to clean those masks if you don't have a lot of uh, uh, spares. And we spoke last week about being able to put a mask in a moist oven uh, for 35 to 60 minutes at about 200 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, we know that for regular cloth masks, they can go into your washing machine at the highest temperature uh, for your longest wash and then into the dryer and that will clean those. We know that the best thing to clean your hands is soap and water. Uh, and after that, you can use a hand sanitizer, recognize that there've been a lot of discredited hand sanitizers out there. They, instead of having ethyl alcohol in them, they have methyl alcohol, mm. which used to be the ingredient of bathtub gin, which would give you something in the old days, Dr. Williams called the Jake Lake. <laughs> so be careful of where you get your hand sanitizer, but believe me, soap and water is the best thing. You should wash your hands for a 20 second period, which is equivalent to saying happy birthday twice. Uh, I don't know about the Stevie Wonder version of it, but say that. <laughs> uh, also, it's good to wear gloves if you are touching surface surfaces. Uh, we think that health professionals should wear N95 masks. They should be fitted. Uh, they are hard to breathe in. Probably don't wear those if you're running. You can use a cloth mask, but it is so important to continue to stay in, to socially distance as much as possible. And I say this thing is not a hoax. It's not about the politics of our nation. This is all over the world. And we want you here next year and the year after that, and we don't want you dead. So be careful, treat yourself and your family. Uh, Dr. Williams, any comments? Uh, my final comment has to do with trying to exhort everybody who's on this call to exhort everybody else that you know to get involved in this fight. This is a fight for our lives, for our survival in any way that you can. Uh, I'll give you an idea of something that I've done. You know, I, I can do a lot of talking and I do uh, about this, this uh, disease and lecturing and so forth. But I think it, it comes down to what you can do from a practical standpoint. So um, I was presented with an opportunity to uh, uh, accumulate a number of, of shields, of face shields. Um, and as I told Dr. Maxey, uh, I'm making, I've gotten hundreds of them, uh, which I'm making available to local doctors and uh, uh, clinics, offices, and also to Drew Medical School, uh, as well as to, uh, to others. Uh, I've already made uh, a number of available to Drew. And uh, so this is something that I felt that I could do from a direct reach out standpoint. And I think all of us have something similar that we can accomplish to help out the effort and to help each other. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fijay? Well, just uh, peace, blessings, and fun and love to everybody. Uh, and uh, as you say, stay safe and vote. I fully totally agree with that. Yeah. Great program. Admiral Dr. Johnson? Um, yeah, I think uh, being safe and wearing masks, I don't understand what the big deal is about not wearing masks. Since, you know, there's so many things that people do, like seat belts and whatnot, and don't even bat an eyelash about. But um, there may be some natural selection that, that will manifest itself eventually. This past weekend, we had 250,000 motorcycle members of the Trump Nation yeah. in uh, Sturgis, South Dakota. None of them had masks on. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, here locally, we had a protest, a uh, social justice protest of about 300 people in my town or the town next to mine, and 100% of them had their mask on. Uh, I think if you just, if you look at oh, just a lot of the, the shots in TV, newspapers or whatnot, uh, a lot of the folks who are on the political opposite of our spectrum, they're the ones who are sitting shoulder to shoulder with not having any masks on. If you look at most of the peaceful protests that Trump is against, 
most of those people have masks on. And as Dr. Fauci said, the virus doesn't care. A crowd is a crowd. It doesn't really care whether you're in church, doesn't care whether you're in a football game, doesn't care whether you're protesting, doesn't care whether you're in a restaurant. As long as you're in a crowd and you don't have a mask on, the virus is happy. Thank you. Dr. Marie, so I would say that we, we need to be sure our people wear their mask and also vote at their earliest opportunity. Do not wait for November 3rd. If you can vote in your, in your community in October, uh, get that absentee ballot in and personally carry it to your registrar of voters. Don't wait on the post office. I take the word of our deceased former mayor of Chicago, vote early. I don't know if we can vote often, but definitely vote early. <laughs> well, I grew up in Chicago, and you know, it's vote early, vote often, don't let death keep you from the polls. <laughs> Dr. Jordan. Dr. Wilbur Jordan. Hi. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. Don't forget, Tony Wayford is on the call for us to have a different discussion after the meeting. Okay. Uh, are there any of our, our physicians on the phone that would like to make a final comment? Well, this is Dr. Sherrod, Dr. Maxey. I know you forgot to call me, but- um, <laughs> Pardon I me. Best of the the blessed. Best blessed. Continuing to you know, carry out these meetings at such a high level, I had to take a sabbatical for a while, but I'm back and I'm glad to see that you're still on point and on the issues. And I also wanted to commend uh, our celebrity guest, Brenda Lee Ager, who is a cotton picker from Alabama. I'm a cotton picker from Mississippi. <laughs> so, that going to do that song. That's my favorite song. And I could have done backup for you. <laughs> and Dr. Maxey, uh, yeah. I would just like to say, thank um, you, Jessica. I would just like to say, okay, I know none of us are ingesting Lysol or bleach, but I have seen people spraying Lysol on their hands, mm. diluting it, but still spraying it on their hands. Mm. That, that is not meant for the skin. No. Okay, so you cannot take these toxic disinfectants and then think you can dilute them and that they're not going to cause you some harm. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I just wanna mention is if you go into a doctor's office as happened with me, with my mother, and they are not properly socially distancing. Okay. You, you have the right to say, and I spoke up and I said, can you call us from the car? Because I did not like the way the lack of social distancing, there were people sitting across from one another. And so they said, sure, you know, but remind them that sitting in every other seat is not adequate for social distancing. If they need to put seats in the hallway, six feet apart, that's what they need to do. But we have to keep everybody accountable, okay? Because it's our lives are at risk. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Motley? Yes. Any final words? Um, I won't ask you about Big Apple. <laughs> I really do. And just remind everybody that when you hear all about these vaccines, they won't be filed correctly unless there's a treatment to uh, reverse the situation in trial participants that the, the vaccine is not effective on. Can you talk about the wand you got me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, being a UV guy, <laughs> I got uh, Dr. Maxey a uh, UV1, which uh, emits UV light at 264 nanometers. It's, a, uh, it's like a chest. It's a, it's a bag that zips up and you can put your mask, your glasses, your cell phone, your keys or any of that stuff in there, zip it up, hit the button, and in three minutes, it will be clear of any kind of virus or bacteria you could think of. So I'm trying to get him in order with the UV. <laughs> so, uh, but if you guys have wands or are getting wands, get protective eye, eye covering. You need glasses that attenuate 264 nanometers because UV will induce cataracts in your eyes. Oh, okay. 
Right. Well, thanks everybody for joining the call. Uh, we appreciate our guests, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Tyler as being our guest speakers. Uh, welcome back Dr. Sherrod and Dr. Faggot and Dr. Williams and Dr. Forget me, I forget everybody's name, uh, Dr. Johnson and who don't even Dr. Motley. We appreciate you all being, being here. And I guess we look us up again on uh, blackhealthtrust.org and we'll see you. We're on every Sunday at 12 noon. We may change to one o'clock PM Pacific time based upon our steering committee meeting this week. So we can pick up some of the church crowd. Thank you very much. So if Simon and Martin can take us off the streaming, there are several of us that want to talk afterward on this call. Dr. Matthew, was Dr. Lisa Urban on? Is, is she on from Jamaica? Dr. Curran? Yeah, is she on? I thought I saw her on before. So 